say hello. If not, we'll try our best to say hello to you. Really love to welcome new people here. And um, yeah, you're in for a real treat of a gathering this morning. Um, just a couple of things in terms of housekeeping. Um, we do have toilets available. They're up that way, through that door through your right, and then through another door on the left, and hopefully you will find them should you need them. There is also a crash available, which is also through that door. Feel free to use that. And uh, the children and youth will be going out after the second song, which hopefully Ian will remember to do, won't you, Ian? Announce, announce that the children and youth are going, don't say that, you'll panic me. So, yeah. <laughs> don't forget. There, there we go. He'll remember. Great. And uh, just to say as well, today we're, uh, we're going to be continuing our series on um, four things that caused the early church uh, to spread like wildfire. And uh, in a bit, I'll be speaking on unity. But before we do that, I, uh, as I was praying and, and thinking about things this morning, I just felt like it would be really good just to start with a bit of silence. So if I can invite you just to stand now. And if you feel comfortable to do so, please feel free to close your eyes. But the thing that I really felt God uh, impressing on my heart this morning was a sense of as we worship him, us just turning our hearts towards him, turning our face towards him. And so wherever you're at right now, why don't you just simply say a quiet prayer in your hearts? And I'll, I'll say a prayer in a few moments. So let's just spend a few moments getting ourselves, preparing ourselves to worship the king. Heavenly Father, we really just want to thank you this morning that you remain on the throne and that, Father, we get to gather here together to worship you in both spirit and truth. I pray this morning, Father, that you would be completely welcome in this gathering. I pray, Father, that we would invite you into all of our praise and our worship. And I pray as we seek to worship you with our whole hearts now, Lord, that we would really feel a sense of you just moving through the words of these songs. Lord, be with us now, I pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Let's worship together. Yes, let's uh, worship as one this great God of ours. Let us worship our King. Come, let us worship our King. Come, let us bow at His feet. He has done great things. See what our Savior has done. See how His love overcomes. He has done great things. has done great things. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquered the grave. You free every captive and break every chain. Oh, God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh, Jesus, our Savior, your name lives. been faithful through every storm. You'll be faithful forevermore. You have done great things. And I know you will do it again. For your promise is yes and amen. You will do great things. God, you do great things. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquered the grave. You free every captive and break every chain. Oh, God, you have done great things. We dance in your feet. 
freedom, awake and alive. Oh Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high. Oh God, you have done great things. Hallelujah, hallelujah, God, above it all. God, and we stand before you as one family, one people who love you, trust in you, and thank you that you walk with us every step of the way. You were the word at the beginning, one with God, the Lord most high. Your hidden glory in creation now revealed in you are Christ. What a beautiful name it is. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a beautiful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus. You didn't want heaven without us, so Jesus, you put heaven down. My sin was great, your love was greater. Could separate us now. What a wonderful name it is. What a wonderful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a wonderful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a wonderful name it is.
heavens are rolling, the praise of your glory, for you are raised to life again. You have no rival, you have no rival, you have no is the kingdom, yours is the glory, yours is the name above all names. What a powerful name it is, what a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus Christ my King. What a powerful name it is. Nothing can stand against What a powerful name it is The name of Jesus You have no rival You have no evil Jesus now and for him Yours is the King What a powerful name it is, nothing can stand against. What a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. children are about to uh, lead us and go to their groups and we want to pray for you. Loving Father, we thank you that you dwell among us, you dwell in us and you dwell in our children. I just pray now that uh, they will, as they leave to go to their groups, they will understand the glory of your word, the glory of you as you seek to fill them with your presence. Bless you all. Have a great time. Won't be as good as ours, but hey, come on. They're going to be going uh, and uh, hearing a little bit about parables and why Jesus told them. We read in the Word that uh, He does so much and He speaks to us through parables, through what we see around us in our daily lives. They are parables that Jesus can speak to us through. He speaks to us all day all night I've heard I've heard a thousand stories of what they think you're like but I've heard the tender whisper of love in the dead of night and you tell i 
I will praise you, O Lord, with all my heart. Before the gods, I will sing your praise. I will bow down towards your holy temple and will praise your name for your love and your faithfulness. For you have exalted above all things your name and your word. When I called you, you answered me. You made me bold and stout-hearted. May all the kings of the earth praise you, O Lord, when they hear the words of your mouth. May they sing of the ways of the Lord, for the glory of the Lord is great. So we were worshipping now, I had a real sense that some of you here this morning are feeling quite disillusioned. Those words, you call us deeper still, I feel are actually really pertinent, for, particularly for some of us here this morning. Perhaps you're feeling a bit like, well, you know, go to church this morning because that's what I do. Or perhaps you're just feeling a little bit like, oh, is, there really, is there really anything to learn here? Is there really any more that you can show me, Father? And I feel the word that for, is for some of you here today that God is calling you deeper still. He is desperate for you to get to know him more intimately. There is always an infinite amount more that we can know about our loving Father. 
And I wonder now if, if any of you has a prayer that you'd like to pray out of thanks. You know, just as that song said, you know, we're loved by him basically because we're his, just because we're simply his children. But why don't we pray out prayers of thanks to God simply for being God? just want to share a picture um, from the start of the service, really, um, and it just fits into this business of going deeper. And it's um, a screw that has got to go into the right position, and there's, there's quite a lot of um, wood worn away as it goes in, and so it's difficult to actually find the channel, that, because it's quite a long screw, and it's got to find the right channel. But it can be, we can start drilling and it's not quite in position and, and it's hitting the wood in the shallow areas and, and God is just showing me just what he has for us when, he, when we manage to just be patient with the alignment and just get into the right point for that screw to begin to catch its thread and begin and now at last we can be turned and turned and turned and go true into the right position that he has for each one of us and he allows that time for us he allows us to take our time but he so wants us to find that perfect position for each one of us amen Amen. Please take a seat. Well, I've just got a couple of uh, notices to mention, some very quick ones, and then I'm going to invite Keith up for our third one um, as well. Um, so firstly, just to say, Man Made is back on again this week uh, on Thursday at 7.30 p.m. So see Keith or uh, Mark for more information. Keith's the one with the, the riot mask on at the back. You can't miss him. So uh, do say hello if you want to get involved. It's really just a great opportunity to hang out with some other guys and talk about faith, um, have a beer, pool, I think, it's usually on offer, etc. So yeah, he's the man to talk to. Um, and secondly, uh, Sunday evening gatherings are starting again. Well, I say starting again. They were on Tuesdays um, before Christmas, um, but we're really excited. These are launching again um, on Sunday. Uh, so this coming Sunday, the 23rd at 7.30 p.m., and they're going to be fortnightly from now on. And predominantly, it's a time of prayer and worship and really um, 
kind of just building on the, on the foundation of the successful Tuesday nights from, uh, from the autumn. And they really were a special time just to pray and encounter Jesus. Also, it's quite nice to have something in the evening sometimes for a change. So do come along. Uh, we'd love to see you there. So Keith, if I can now invite you up and yeah, this is the Riot Shield man uh, or Riot Mask man. So yes. You took a big risk, Johnny, inviting me up here after that comment. Uh, At the start of the service, Johnny asked us all to be quiet. But you know me, that's not my style. I want you to make some noise. Uh, Today, I can announce that PCC have approved the completion of the Trinity Centre building. Thank you. That's uh, subject to... The generosity of, of you in, in donations and loans, we've got some grants outstanding. We still need prayers for release of funding to be able to pay back the loans. Uh, and it won't complete the inside of the building in terms of fitting out, but it'll get all the contractors off the site and it'll become ours. So that's uh, amazing news. Uh, we have to thank God and we have to thank you guys. Thank you. Amen. Thank you. Great. Lovely. Well, at this point, I'm going to invite Dale up as he's going to give us our Bible reading. It's a very short one, though, I do warn you. So um, take it away, Dale. A reading from the book of the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 1, verse 14. They all joined together constantly in prayer, along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. This is the word of the Lord. Lovely. Thanks, Dale. Short and sweet. Great. (laughs) Yes, you've got me this morning. So, um, yeah, it's the best that they could do, I was told. So um, here I am. Um, No, it really is a a pleasure and a privilege to uh, be up here speaking again to you all. And hopefully God's got some good stuff to say through uh, things that he's put on my heart. So um, I'll I'll just pray over this now. Yeah, Heavenly Father, I just pray as I deliver this talk that you would be with me in, in, in your spirit, really. I, I pray that, Father, as these words are conveyed, that they would reach those places, perhaps those people who are feeling a bit disillusioned by things. I just pray that there'd be something that stands out in this talk, not because of my eloquence or wisdom, Father, but simply because of the message of Christ that is in this. I pray, Father, that you would just remind us all that As we hear this word now, it's you that wants to speak and no one else. Amen. Well, so earlier on I mentioned that we're going to be looking at unity, but I thought I'd start by talking a little bit about redwood trees in California. Now, bear with me on this one. I like to do this, just to keep you on your toes, really, or just to be annoying, I'm not sure which. Um, But since about the 1850s, uh, Californian redwood trees have been farmed for their sheer uh, resilience as building materials. I don't know if you know, but they're like incredibly rot-resistant, weatherproof, and insect-resistant. And some of them are over 300 feet high and over 2,500 years old. And one would think that trees so large uh, would have a, a tremendous root system reaching down hundreds of feet into the earth. But interestingly, the redwoods uh, actually have a very shallow system of roots. So how do they uh, get so big and stand so long, I hear you ask? Good question. Uh, a redwood's shallow but widespread roots uh, help them survive by intertwining with the roots of the other trees around them. Intertwined root systems provide stability to these mighty trees during strong winds and floods. They quite literally hold one another down. And their shallow roots can also sprout and support new redwood trees far more successfully than from their cone seeds. Redwoods can often be found growing in circles, known as fairy rings or family circles, because they sprouted from the parent uh, of the, well, from the, from the roots of a parent tree. And the parent tree helps to nourish the sprouts with water and sugars them um, through its well-established root system while they grow. And interestingly, when the parent tree dies, the young redwoods continue to grow in this circle shielding, stabilizing and, and nourishing each other with, uh, within their roots. Redwoods will help each other even if they aren't family. 
you know, trees in the ring aren't always genetically identical uh, or clones of the parent tree. Redwoods take care of one another, uh, supporting each other with nutrients through their interconnected roots, including their young, sick, and old. In short, redwoods are not only stronger together, they simply can't survive without each other. So this morning, we're continuing on, as I said, with four things that caused the early church to spread like wildfire. I kind of hesitate to mention the word wildfire when I'm talking about trees. Um, but the topic for this week's talk is a passion for unity. And, you know, I didn't just want to share all these facts about trees because I have a particular love for trees. Um, I'm not particularly green-fingered, if I'm honest. Um, but I, I, the reason really was because I, I think they depict a really beautiful image of what Christ hopes for his bride, the church, uh, to be. A unified body of believers that is not only stronger together, but who simply can't survive without each other. There's a saying that it takes a forest to grow a redwood, while I believe it takes an entire church to grow one believer. Our passage this morning, as I said, was taken from Acts 1.14. And uh, one of the noticeable hallmarks of the early church, um, particularly shown in this passage, uh, is the particular way that it is reflected. Um, uh, well, I guess it's this sense of unity that we see in this passage amongst believers. You know, it's clear that key figures in the uh, early church were passionate about unity. But you know, actually, this wasn't always found to be very true among all the believers, it's interesting when we throw the term early church in there, it can mean all sorts of things to different people. But this verse from Acts is an encouraging example of unity at its best. However, even Paul himself had to address disunity in the early church. You know, for example, if we look at Corinthians, uh, 1 Corinthians 1, 10 to 12, uh, it reads like this. It says, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another in what you say. And that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly united in mind and thought. My brothers and sisters, some from Chloe's household have informed me that there are quarrels among you. What I mean is this. One of you says, I follow Paul. Another, I follow Apollos. Another, I follow Cephas. Still another, I follow Christ. You see, this scripture clearly shows us that divisions had become apparent um, and Christians had begun to uh, kind of pick their preferred leader to follow, as it were. And Paul reminds us that Christ is the one whom we should follow and that this isn't optional. Which leads me on to my first point today, that I believe unity is not optional, you know? If we're part of this church, unity has to be part of it too. Paul's frustration in the previous passage is one that is centred on a love for this unified church. The bride, as the church is known throughout Scripture, um, is to become beautiful through unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace, which we see represented in Ephesians 4. Unity in the church has never and will never be an optional extra. The reason I believe that the church should be unified is because it's supposed to represent the oneness of Christ to the Father, which we see depicted in John 17. I don't know if you're aware, but there are currently around 45,000 um, Christian denominations globally. And uh, a further 260 new denominations spring up each year. And actually, this isn't uh, a new thing. Even in the third century, uh, a bishop named Cyprian penned a work entitled The Unity of the Church. It's his most famous work um, in which he hoped to dissuade people from leaving churches or forming their own outside of the recognized church at the time. And this was a particularly difficult time as the Roman emperor of the day and he was the first one, actually, to uh, issue a decree that um, basically required everyone in the empire to sacrifice to the gods of the empire. And so whilst thousands died for their faith in Jesus Christ, uh, many others actually just gave in and made sacrifices to these gods. And so this caused great division. There was theological divide over whether or not people could be forgiven for this. And Cyprian was someone who was leaning towards the side of, you know, forgiveness um, but yeah, as you can imagine, this caused all sorts of divisions in the church. And interestingly, in this document, he writes this. He says, do not deceive yourselves by misinterpreting the words of the Lord that wherever two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. Corruptors of the gospel quote these words, ignoring 
the ones that came just before, as they themselves are separated from the church. So they divorce one section of the text from the next. For the Lord, urging his disciples to unanimity and peace, said, I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about what you ask for, it shall be given to you by my Father in heaven. This shows that God gives, not in accordance with, uh, to the number of those who ask, but in, ordinance, uh, in accordance with their, uni- I can never get this word right, unanimity, if two of you shall agree on earth, agreement comes first. This shows that our firm and faithful gr- agreement is essential. You see, believers were kind of leaving churches and forming their own, basing it on the misreading of this scripture. And what Cyprian is expressing here is, uh, is basically that, you know, even if you had a church full of 100 believers all praying together, but they weren't actually in um, unity of spirit, it's not truly a united church. He says, you know, that even two or three would be far better if they were in agreement. See, if we want to be a church, we have to be unified. It's not a case of us all simply coming to church together on a Sunday morning and worshipping and praying together for it to be a truly unified church. See, if we don't firmly agree with one another and worship and pray with that same agreement or unity, then we're not really united at all. Therefore, unity is not optional, I would say, and there is no gray area in it, really. You know, we either agree with one another or we don't. We either stand together in unity or we are divided. We are either the church or we are not. It's interesting, Cyprian actually quotes this, and I'm not quite sure where it sits or if I fully understand it, but I I quite like the quote that he says, and he says that uh, no one can have the church for his father, uh, sorry, no one can have um, uh, God for his father if he won't have the church for his mother. And I just thought it's a really interesting way of looking at it. But uh, my, my second point today, because actually I think it's really important to then think about how, how do we actually achieve this unity? Because I've talked about it from a, a reason why we need it you know, and, and other bits. But actually, um, I, I think unity is only really kind of found um, when we have a common purpose together. And the scripture at the beginning alluded to Christ's disciples having a passion for unity. Uh, but the truth is, as we've already seen, it's far more than just a passionate pursuit that leads us to this unity. The disciples had more than just passion. They had a mandate from Christ, a clear and common purpose, I would argue. In Ephesians 4, uh, verses 11 to 13, we read this. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and the teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. The unity of the apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors and teachers is only achieved when we share a common purpose, ultimately to attain the whole measure of the fullness of Christ through our oneness. Recently, a guy called Chris Kandaya, who's the founder of an adoption charity called Home for Good, shared this of his local churches in his hometown. He said, there is little I have seen that unites the various churches in my town. They seem to coexist pretty peacefully, but entirely independently. I have, however, discovered an exception. The concerted effort once a year to come together to prevent the council levying car park charges on Sunday mornings. And although somewhat humorous, it's actually quite a sad situation. You know, if we contrast this with the scripture we've just read in Ephesians, it seems such a trivial thing to be united on. Instead of the fullness of Christ, their common purpose was the cost of a car park. If our common purpose as a church is anything other than seeking the fullness of Christ, then we are seriously missing the mark on what it means to be a united church. So to recap for a moment, I realize I talk quite fast as well, so it might be helpful. We've explored that unity is not optional. And that we can't truly be the church unless we are truly unified. That is to say that we are in agreement with one another. Secondly, we've seen that this is achieved through having a shared common purpose, which should be to seek Christ in all of his fullness. And now my third and final point 
is that unity starts with us. It starts with you. It starts with me, first and foremost. Occasionally, Jen, my wife, asks me if I, uh, I might like to make her a cup of tea. I know, can you believe it? But to which I, uh, I have been known to reply, but Jen, I just went to the shop and got the milk for you. To which Jen will reply, ooh, a transactional relationship, is it, Johnny? Um, you know, there's a bit of this kind of running joke uh, between us where we have to remind each other that when we'd like something doing, we can't just expect that person to do it based on a task that we did earlier on in the day. Although it's often very tempting if one of us feels like we've done more than the other. And I wonder if our relationships are like that with people sometimes too, not just our spouses. Perhaps we go up to a person and say hello, we talk about the weather or provide just enough kind of small talk in the hopes that we might convince them that we're really interested in how we're doing or perhaps we even convince ourselves uh, that we are. But actually deep down we're really just waiting for that kind of right moment to make our request and hope that somehow we've convinced them that we care about them enough that when we, uh, at least in the moment, uh, really just want something from them, they would provide it. There's almost this kind of subtle expectation that underlies the actions we do so much of the time. And here are a few phrases that I found on the internet um, with regards to uh, transactional uh, relationships and ones that both parties might ask. And you might feel familiar, I certainly did. Um, if I do that, what do I get? This relationship is not worth putting the, uh, the effort uh, I'm putting in. You need to understand my perspective. Now, there are just a few, um, but yeah, I'm, I'm, I don't know about you, but I'm totally guilty of these things. And I felt really challenged, particularly on the perspective one. You know, you need to understand my perspective. You know, when it comes to church unity, there should be no place for these transactional relationships. And I know that we're all guilty of it. But this is just one example of where when we look inwardly, we can see that we might be part of the problem. And that actually, there are many others in this area that I could talk about. But the bottom line is, church unity starts within our own hearts. It's when we come before Christ. In Matthew 22, uh, verses 36 to 40, we read, Teacher, what is, uh, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus replies, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. And this is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. You see, this very well-known passage illustrates that in order to love our neighbor well, we need to have a love for ourselves. And this love that is shaped um, needs to be shaped by a love for God first. It always starts with him. And then we learn how to love ourselves, and then we can love our neighbor truly. In essence, our ability to love and serve one another in unity as a church starts in our hearts. And in order for true unity to be achieved, our hearts need to be tuned towards God's. To have a passion for unity is Christ's heart and desire for his bride his church. It felt a really difficult talk to do this one. I think 15 minutes does not do it justice. <laughs> it's a massive area. And all I hoped from this talk is that you felt challenged as to why we need unity. But my, my hope now is that in a few moments we'll pray and if I can invite the worship team back up. My hope is that I'm just going to invite the Holy Spirit to come. I know I do that a lot, but that's because I'm passionate that that's how God actually does things in our lives. He works through the power of the Holy Spirit. My hope is that we would see the example of the Californian redwood trees at the beginning and be just like them in the sense of we simply can't survive without one another. You might have come to church this morning with a heavy, heavy heart. You might be thinking, there's no way I can have unity with that person. I've tried. Johnny, I've tried. Believe me, I've tried. Well, do you know what? I'm not telling you to. Christ is. Actually, the whole point of it being a bride is that it is to be beautiful. When there is disunity in the bride, church um, fathers would argue that it's no bride of Christ's. It's no church of his. 
And I don't do this to put you down or shame you. I do this to say, I, I implore you, that if we are to move as a church body, united in purpose, then that is actually the key thing we need, particularly in this next season. The whole point of unity throughout the Bible and the reason Christ died and paid such a high price was that the church would be distinct in the way that it, it, it looked in its unity. It was, supposed to, it was supposed to stand out from the world in that unity. And let's be honest, you know, we, we don't always live up to that unity. But you know, there's a God who does, and there's a God who wants to work with us in that. So again, I want to invite you just to close your eyes. And I'm just going to pray a prayer. But again, I want you just to listen to the Holy Spirit. You might not know what that means. That might be a completely alien concept. What do you mean, listen to the Holy Spirit? What I mean is, as I pray these words over us, I just want you to simply listen. Is there something? Is there a picture? Is there a word? Is there anything that enters into your mind that you think, hang on a minute, that seems like it might actually be from God. And if there is something, you need to go away and pray about that. Talk to a friend about it. Start thinking, is there a place where I need to really move and and think about how can I become more unified with the church that I belong to? So let me pray. Heavenly Father, I I want to thank you so much that you paid such an incredibly high price for this unity. That the oneness that we see represented in the Trinity is exactly what you desire for your bride, the church. And I pray this morning for each one of us that you would reveal things on our hearts right now. I pray that if there's any area where we're feeling a sense of disunity with any of our brothers and sisters here, I pray that if there's a sense of, I just can't forgive that person, or perhaps we've just thought, well, I think I'm being unified. You know, I'm I'm unified, but actually I'm only unified in the sense that I avoid those people. I avoid the ones that I don't agree with. Father, I pray wherever we're at this morning, just as we spend a few moments now, would you reveal those things through the power of your Holy Spirit to us now, Lord? So, Heavenly Father, as we continue on now in worshipping you, I just pray we'd hold these things close in our heart. If any of the words have stood out from the talk, if you've laid something on our hearts through the Holy Spirit, whatever it might be, Father, I just pray that you would help us just to really ponder that now, to worship that out if we need to, if we need to say sorry in our hearts or forgive someone. I just pray, Father, that you would invite us into a place now to worship you. Amen. Amen. Why don't we stand and over to you, Ian. There's uh, one of the things that we've been talking about uh, in terms of unity is that we are united by Jesus. It is him who draws us together. The Trinity, yes, Jesus, the Father, the Spirit that dwells within us. And that's given to us by God's grace. We haven't done a thing to deserve it, haven't done a thing to earn it. It is freely his. Do we accept that and live it? And that is the unity that we we seek. my soul. I rest my soul on Jesus. When the mountains shake, I put my trust in Jesus. The moment I awake, and when soul is lost at sea. He will be my rock, my vision be in Christ alone.
His grace is all we've got. His love is like the mighty ocean. His love for me will never stop. Oh, His arms are strong enough to carry me through it all by the grace of God. So high upon His shoulders, safely bore the His love is like the mighty ocean. His love for me will never stop. Oh, His arms are strong enough to carry me through it all by the grace of God. His love is like the mighty ocean. His love for me will never stop. Oh, His arms are strong enough to carry me through it all by the grace of God. His love is like. His love is like the mighty Oh, His love for me will never stop. Oh, His arms are strong enough to carry me through it all by the grace of God.
His love for me will never stop. Oh, his arms are strong enough to carry me through it all by the grace of God. We stand united in his love. He holds all of us in his hands. And it's by his grace that we will leave this place and be his hands and his feet in everything that uh, he wants to do in our town. Every knee will bow before him. Our 
God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. His blood breaks the chains, and every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Every knee will bow before Him. Well, this is uh, the end of our service now, sadly. Um, But I'm going to pray for us in a moment to close. Um, But before I do, just a couple of things to mention. Realise, obviously, this is quite a big topic. And it's not always as easy as just forgiving someone. Perhaps for some of you, you'll feel a sense of, I really just feel like I can't. Well, you're in luck. Um, That's why we've got a brilliant prayer team that are available in St. Michael's Chapel. So it's just through there. The only requirement is that you wear a face mask. And also, if you had any questions about, you know, when I was mentioning about listening to the Spirit as well, the prayer team love to do exactly that. And they actually mentioned um, that they'd uh, had the name Amy. Someone sensed that maybe God was saying the name Amy. So if you are called Amy, you know someone who's called Amy, and you think, actually, they really need prayer, it's probably uh, usually an encouragement to, uh, to go up and receive some prayer. But they would love to pray with you, and they'd be brilliant as well if you, you know, need prayer for reconciliation between others, etc., etc. So, yes, I'm just going to pray for us now. Yeah, so Heavenly Father, I just really want to thank you for this church body. I, I do really genuinely want to thank you for their love for one another, for their love for you. And I want to particularly thank you for the faithful people that are continuing to watch online as well. That they're remaining unified with this church body as much as they can with the pandemic hindering things. So Father, I just want to thank you for them. And I pray that you would stand firm with each one of us in the coming weeks, months, years. And Father, I just pray for complete unity in this church. Where there is disunity, Father, may we rid ourselves of it quickly. May we be quick to forgive and slow to anger. Amen. Well, thank you ever so much for joining us. If you want a double portion, feel free to watch it online. It goes up later on today. Um, But other than that, have a great week and we'll see you soon. Thanks.